And this is, uh, as Christine says, a, a systematic review uh, on the relationship of, just to get into a little more detail at the beginning, uh, of land rights certification, registration, or titling. In other words, some kind of typically state-led effort to uh, certify uh, in law and in records uh, a family's rights to a discrete area of land. Now, a lot of us who may come from you know, the US or Europe sort of assume, well, that's sort of a, a, an important attribute of any kind of land tenure or property rights system, certified, registered land rights, because we associate that attribute with a key element of what we think is important to agricultural development, which is land tenure security. It's a very simple notion found in neoclassical economics and, and cons with common sense, and those two don't always correspond, uh, that you know, if a family is going to invest in their property, uh, they need to have a clear expectation that far into the future, the kinds of sacrifices, investments of labor, capital, materials into that land, and the benefits that come from those investments will accrue to them. So the relationship, very simple relationship between land tenure security, property rights security, and uh, investment. So good outcomes happen in, in theory and often in, pra in observed practice where people have clear tenure security. Now in many developing countries, the kind of formal certification systems or property rights systems, titling systems that we are familiar with maybe in the wealthy countries are not present. A lot of farmers farm on land owned by the state. In Africa particularly, a lot of farming, in fact maybe 80 to 90 percent of all farming is done on land that's held under customary tenure regimes where land rights are not certified formally. People gain access to land through different principles. And so DFID asked a group of scholars uh, in, I guess it was 2013, uh, and there were four of us. Myself, I was at the Kennedy School at the time. Uh, another colleague, uh, Sarah Sammy, a political scientist at NYU. Uh, a colleague, Ruth Hall, at the program in Land and Agrarian Studies uh, at the University of Western Cape in, in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, and Aaron Leopold, who was at the time at the Global Governance Institute in, in, uh, in Brussels, asked us to pull together a team of other researchers, graduate students, to do a systematic review on the relationship between investments in land rights certification or titling in the developing world. And of course, part of the development discourse over the last 30 or 40 years has been African agriculture will not take off unless people have clear tenure security. And there's this underlying assumption that that is delivered through land rights certification or titling. The same in Latin America and parts of Asia. So in light of the fact that over the last 30 to 40 years, there have been a number of efforts to actually convert uh, you know, non-formally tenured regimes into formally tenured regimes based on certification by the state, the question that DFID asked us to look into, well, what have been the effects with respect to the expected increases following land rights certification in investment, in productivity, in farmer incomes, in, for instance, flow of credit, because another part of the theory is with a title, you can take it to the bank and get credit. And so that was, our, that was the topic of our systematic review. Uh, being uh, an evidence-based institution that's committed a lot of resources to doing systematic reviews, you understand what they involve, so I don't have to go into that. But you know, our, basically, uh, you know, our inclusion criteria, a familiar term uh, for many of you, uh, was limited to studies that were based on um, randomized uh, control trials. In other words, randomized sa samples of farming households in an area that had received a treatment, which was, say, land rights certification, in comparison to a community where we were able to control all other factors apart from the fact that that community had not received land rights certification, to look at empirically the effects of the certification intervention on investment, productivity of agriculture, farmer family incomes, and access uh, to credit. And so what were our results? Oh, let me just say briefly that we, and those of you who have done systematic reviews know, this, know, the, know the pain, but our mainly graduate students looked at 25,000 titles on the subject. They, did, they reduced that to a, a review of 1,000 abstracts, which yielded 100 papers that we looked at in detail, and only 20 studies met our inclusion criteria. So this is a huge question for the development world,
for economic theory, a whole host of issues, and only 20 studies met sort of a, which, which you might characterize as a, as a rigorous empirical research design. And those studies fell in, uh, let's see, nine countries. Uh, and there were 20 studies that fell in nine countries. Uh, there were five in Latin America, five in, that is, studies in Latin America, five in Asia, and 10 in Africa. Now, what were the results? Okay. Now, the results I, I, I found very interesting, and, and uh, I, I think you will too. In the Latin American and Asia cases, they're after certification or typically titling in Latin America especially, there were significant average gains to productivity, and I'm focusing on the productivity question especially. Significant average gains to productivity after tenure recognition, after the certificate, of between upwards of 50 and 100 percent gains in productivity. And strongly positive gains to investment and income following tenure recognition, typically titling. So very significant gains to uh, productivity and strongly positive gains to investment and, and, and household income. However, in the Africa cases, there were weak or modest gains to productivity, that is between zero and 10 percent following certification. That is gains to productivity and investment and income. Though in most cases, there were still positive gains. Okay, so that's the second important finding. The third finding was there was no or weak discernible credit effects anywhere. So this notion of credit flowing from titles. Is, most studies, and we, we were actually looking very carefully at through a gender lens with respect to differential effects on men and women. Most studies fail to disaggregate effects of tenure recognition on women, though two quantitative studies identified positive effects, effects one in Ethiopia, one in Rwanda. Okay. So, so then the question becomes, well, why these sort of significant gains in Latin America and Asia and these relatively weak or modest gains in the Africa cases? And we have three hypotheses that we're exploring through further research. We're going to publish the, uh, uh, our, uh, our findings uh, uh, you know, based, we're going to take, take the work into a new direction and exploring more deeply what might explain the weaker responses in Africa. The first hypothesis is, is what we're calling the role of pre-existing institutions, and in Africa, specifically customary tenure. Okay. Customary tenure often, and often very typically, provides high levels of tenure security to those who hold land under, tenure, uh, under customary tenure. Customary tenure systems are systems that provide access to land as a social right by virtue of one's membership in the community. You're a bona fide member of that community. Now, this land, an indicator of the, of the, of the security of that tenure is, is that it's often inheritable uh, to other family members, but it can't be sold, most typically. So for poor people in Africa who have access to land, this is land at, free of charge uh, as a social right. And that is a pervasive institution in Africa. So the designers of these programs, we hypothesize, were likely underestimating the, the, the tenure insecurity of people who held those lands. And so when those land rights were certified, uh, the kind of productivity gains or investment gains that would have been projected, assuming prior tenure insecurity, didn't happen. Those assumptions were misplaced. A third factor is what we're calling the wealth effect, is that household resources or wealth income in, in Africa are much lower among poor farmers in comparison to poor farmers in Latin America and in Asia. So, you know, if you're going to really do something with your land, it's just not about land as an asset. It's about labor, capital, uh, having the income to invest in, uh, you know, in your farming enterprise. And, 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 and the generally high levels or low levels of income among African farmers constrain the ability of farmers to make better use of their land. That's hypothesis number two. And the third hypothesis is what we're calling complementary public investments. And these are things like, you know, land, you know, those of us who work in the land tenure field have long been talking about, you know, it's not about land reform alone, it's about what we call agrarian reform. This is very much a lesson from Latin America, is that it's just not providing secure land rights to people, it's about providing packages of support around farming, 
uh, inputs, access to markets, roads, infrastructure, uh, cooperatives, uh, and so on, and farmer training that enable, once again, the farmers to capitalize on their secure land rights. And levels of public investment uh, in rural areas in Africa are, we believe, much lower uh, than, uh, than, than they are in Latin, in Latin America and Asia. And so, you know, one of our arguments is that, you know, when talking about land rights certification or formalization in Africa, you really have to approach it as a package uh, of investments uh, that go into roads and, and, and other kinds of investments. And you also have to take account of, the, of this wealth effect. And so I think I'm sort of not more than a minute over, and I'll leave it at that and welcome questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, it, I'm sure there is a large number of questions, so um, let me see uh, hands um, of those who would like to say. Um, William and then Bimbika, and one more in the first round. And the, um, the, I would say the predictable suspect. Uh, William <laughs> first, Bimbika, and, <laughs> and then Pablo. It sounds like a fascinating study, and I'm looking forward to reading, mm. reading it. Um, a simple question. It sounds like the converse of what you found in Africa would be true in Asia and Latin America, that the customary rights were under threat. Can mm. you uh, say a bit more about that? That the customary rights in Asia were under, th or, or under, under threat? That in comparison to Africa, mm -hmm. yeah. they were less stable. Th that not knowing the Asia sort of agrarian history, if you will, as well. I would say that's, 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 that would likely be the case. The, the colonial experience in Africa was, except for in those countries where there was not, uh, where there were large settler communities, Kenya being an outstanding example, Zimbabwe being an outstanding example, the, the approach of the colonial states was to basically allow customary tenure regimes to continue more or less unaffected, although they introduced sort of an underlying state assertion, they asserted underlying state ownership of customary land. But on the, on the surface, customary institutions through traditional authorities more or less continued unaffected. And so that today, you know, we have customary tenure regimes dominant. An, an explanation is with respect to the Asian difference would be the maybe larger sort of uh, uh, agrarian interests, foreign agrarian interests, high demand for land, facilitation under the colonial governments and sort of securing that land uh, and sort of large scale plantation style enterprises, for instance. And, and so the kind of norm uh, of, the, of, of inheritance of the customary, of sort of tenure policy was very much a, a, either a state owned kind of regime, it's a combination of a state owned regime and then a, a private regime and customary tenure would have been marginalized. That, that could be the case. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for the very fascinating presentation. I had two sort of interrelated questions. Mm -hmm. One was on methodology. Can mm -hmm. you um, explain your justification for s using or focusing on studies that used RCTs? Mm -hmm. And while I can understand that you know, exploring the linkages between titling and investment is a lot easier when you, do, uh, when you focus on studies that use RCTs, it also means that you know, RCTs is still um, sort of a recent methodological mm. development. So does that limit the type of research that you can focus on? And the second is, um, I'm interested in your question, ab oh, in, in your hypothesis about, um, about uh, customary tenure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm wondering um, if you could please elaborate on how you would carry out further research, especially because customary tenure, as you know, is, is very fluid. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, would you, again, focus on RCTs or would you broaden your horizon? Yeah, yeah. Very good point. And one thing I failed to name, mention because of the shortage of time is that our study included uh, a set of qualitative studies. Uh, they were not only quantitative, in fact, kind of we sort of, the study stands apart from systematic reviews which focus on quantitative studies because of 
kind of a, a systematic reviews are very much about selecting studies that use a common methodology so that you can analyze the data sort of in sort of collectively. Uh, but we s sort of systematically, if you will, selected a set of qualitative studies to look particularly at the, the gender questions, which we feared, we sort of expected, and that proved to be the case, would not uh, be treated well in the, the, uh, the, the RCTs. And so, you know, that arguably is a subject maybe for another talk, but we got much more sort of, we're able to get much more nuanced understanding of some of these issues, particularly with respect to the effects of uh, certification or titling on, 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 on women's income, well-being, rights, and so on. Uh, now with respect to, and once again, I'll, I hope we can share the, a link to the larger study with, with everyone. Uh, with respect to the second question, customary tenure and its fluidity, um, this is a very live area of sort of debate and discourse and policy reform and making in, in sort of the, the, the land policy field, particularly in Africa. There's a growing recognition that of the importance of customary tenure rights to the poor. If you sort of convert customary systems to private title systems, the people who stand the greatest chance of losing out are the poor. Once again, this is a system that provides access to land as a social right by virtue of your membership in the community. And for poor people, land secured in this fashion is often the only secure asset uh, apart from their labor uh, that they have access to. And so to take away that right through, you know, through conversion and giving rein to land markets and so on and so forth raises you know, serious welfare questions. And so there's a growing recognition that if we're really concerned about rural poverty, we need to, to take on board the role that customary tenure plays in alleviating poverty, providing something of a safety net, very much relates to questions of migration that Christine and, and other colleagues are concerned about. You go off to town, you still have that land base in the rural area in which you can invest, very important for social reproduction and other values. So in all of this, the question becomes, referring to, I think, the future, uh, a concern, a growing concern about the need to protect customary tenure rights. So we're seeing a movement in Africa around what's called sort of efforts to promote in law the statutory recognition of customary tenure. Because as I said earlier in response to William's question, during the colonial era, state tenure was put on the, underneath the customary systems, today making them vulnerable to arbitrary taking by the state and conversion to other purposes. So the notion is, is that customary tenure rights will be given, recognized statutorily at a level equal to state land, land held under by the state, and land held under private tenure. Okay. And so it, it would enjoy all the kind of rights that other tenure regimes would enjoy. And there are a number of countries who've embraced this approach. Botswana has this system since 1968, something of a model. There's no, no new private land was created in Botswana after independence in 1968. It's customary tenure, uh, very secure, access as a social right. Uh, Kenya and its new land policy has adopted this policy. The South Sudan has. So that's, I think, very exciting and very important. There's pushback, for sure, because people, other people want that land for other purposes. But, uh, Thank you, Steve. The next, next question is Pablo's. I'll try to be briefer in my response. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steve, for the talk. Quite interesting findings. My question is a bit more, what, what exactly do you mean when you talk about the after? Because I think there's a temporal dimension in that. And I think it takes some time since the titles are granted until the people get the benefits. Mm -hmm. of those rights. And I think that differs uh, across the different regions. And mm -hmm. I think mainly in Latin America also, uh, there can be some other factors that explain uh, how long it takes for the people to get the benefits of those rights. Mm -hmm. And even those productivities, even though they can increase right afterwards, they, there are some other factors that explain why they can sustain over time and even they can drop. So how is that the studies that you have been looking at, they take into account this temporal dimension? The temporal uh, dimension, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it was very much a mixed set of studies. You know, we basically selected studies that, 
that looked at uh, you know, reforms or conversions between 1980 and 2012, and that the, the length of time, that the temporal factor uh, was not explicitly taken into account. In other words, there, there were studies in the mix that had looked at the effects over a 20-year period in some cases. Others had looked at the effects after a three-year period. So, you know, so that's, you know, that we weren't controlling for that. And you're, you're raising some important questions. Time is important to the kind of life of any enterprise. Uh, and what we saw in some of the Latin American cases, the Nicaragua case, it was sort of a land reform beneficiary sort of settlement community that, that had been held back. That was the argument. It had gotten land, people were settled there, and so on and so forth, but had not gotten the title. You know, you remember part of the sort of agrarian history in the, in the 70s and 80s, you know, that promises of title, things got complicated. And so finally these folks got their title. And so a lot was already in place. You know, networks, people knew where the market was, investment in housing and some investment in land. And with the title, it just really took off. This is where we saw this like 50% growth, 50% initial growth, okay? Because we saw a drop off in productivity, you know, over time, the kind of settling into kind of a new sort of mean. But, but the time factor is, is very important. You know, six of the 10 African studies were, were uh, in Ethiopia, which skews our findings, you know, but these are mainly World Bank studies. World Bank has been doing a lot of research and some investment in land rights certification of customary rights in Ethiopia. And, you know, the, the, the responses were, you know, short term, you know, and so maybe over the longer term, we'll see a pickup but the, the, the interventions had, had, are fairly recent, um, and really in the last uh, you know five to ten years, Hopta and would would argue that things are now sort of gaining momentum. We're seeing more tree planting on these farms that have been certified under the law and so on. So time is a factor. Thank you. We have two more people, but if I could just assert my right, yeah. because I'm standing, um, mm -hmm. to um, just a, a little bit more clarification, because I think a few of the things you've said here recently about the fact that there was really great variation in the temporal mm -hmm. uh, dimension, but yeah. also that three, three of your um, of, of studies were in one country. Six. Or so. Oh. Wow. Um, I, I just wanted to say, if we could <laughs> clarify that, because we're talking about the whole world. We're talking about yeah. Asia. We're talking about Latin America, right. and we're talking about Africa, and you've got 20 studies, which yeah. really yeah. worries me, especially with the issue of, of these systematic reviews that yeah. we, we um, squash 20,000 articles into 20. Right. Yeah. Um, could you just say a few more words about what, what, what these 20 articles were and how, yeah. and, and how you actually, because you have, you know, obviously your knowledge doesn't derive from the systematic review about what, the, what, the, what you think the important biases were mm -hmm. because of this particular approach. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is the first systematic review that I have been involved in. And my colleague at NYU, Cyrus Sami, who's really, a, I think, a very you know, brilliant quantitative political scientist, had done several. <coughs> uh, and so he uh, was, you know, in, t in terms of Working within the protocol, if you will, I think we we uh, we were uh, you know uh, the, the process had integrity, but the questions you raise are questions that I have in my mind also. Uh, I mean, there's this one observation one can make: randomized control trials, okay, come out of the medical field where you there is control, if you will, uh, uh, with respect to. Uh, uh, inputs, the pill you take, and the population, and so on. And one has to, you know, understand that even within a country like Ethiopia, there's tremendous variation in the landscape, in the, in the agrarian history, uh, in uh, land use strategies, and uh, there are some uh, agroforestry focused programs, there are others focused on uh, cropland, and so all these variations are not, you know, need to be addressed uh, with, with care and, uh, you know, we can make some generalizations within Ethiopia on the basis of six studies, but, you know, I, I want to emphasize that on the basis of the studies, these were the findings. Now, one thing that we did do was, you know, these Africa results, hmm, they kind of, tens, ten, half the studies were from Africa, 
they really stood apart from the other studies, five of which were Asia, five of which Latin America. So, so what we did was we went back to the literature and looked at studies that had, had been excluded, that had, had just sort of almost made it into the, into the, met the inclusion criteria, but for some fairly technical, they were randomized control trials, but we might have had an issue or something. And we looked at those and we included those in the mix and saw, thought, well, is there anything that sort of might raise particular questions? And it didn't. It didn't. Now, the methodological problem there was the question of selecting those, you know, the selection biases that might have been among the researchers. I think that what we're left with is, okay, maybe there's something here and let's go deeper. And in Africa, based on my experience, going deeper means looking at customary tenure. And, and knowing something about Africa's agrarian history, that the, the assumptions from the West that customary tenure is inherently insecure is deeply flawed. Okay. So let's sort of apply that kind of knowledge to land tenure reform interventions and see, you know, and do more studies. What is the productivity effect of? We, we were certifying land tenure all over the place in, in many African studies. We're not doing research. We're not assessing what difference it actually makes uh, uh, against the assumptions. And huge investments are involved in converting tenure to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to title or to sort of a huge public sector investments, huge maintenance and administrative costs. Kenya invested very heavily beginning at the end of the colonial period and into the independence era in converting virtually nearly all land in Kenya to uh, title. The whole system kind of turned to dust because of the administrative costs and because People felt that their land tenure security was delivered through custom. They didn't register their transactions, and so the whole record system was out of date within a generation. So we need to take all this on board. But is it going to change minds about, about, uh, about the, the virtue of, of this kind of intervention? Probably not you know, at the popular level, but it may give pause. Let's think a little bit about what we're doing. Thank you. We've got um, Louis and then Miguel with questions. Thanks for your introduction to your article. It sounds very interesting, especially uh, sort of considering um, the potential uh, for customary tenure to uh, represent a different kind of, of security mm -hmm. over time. There's a small group of us now mm -hmm. starting to look at um, collective tenure reform, some new work on collective tenure reform in China. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're starting to see a very interesting debate mm -hmm. um, between, uh, among people who think that the individualization or the, at the, to the right. family level of land rights in China and the subsequent huge increase in productivity after that um, is evidence um, in favor of privatization, mm -hmm. whereas others uh, and, and of course, um, land can still be redistributed in China. So there's a, the other side is that um, uh, over time, uh, at the, there's the potential to maintain equitable distribution into the future. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm 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 wondering if um, the studies that you looked at in Africa on customary tenure that that have uh, that cover customary tenure systems mm -hmm. all include. Um, redistribution mm -hmm. as a, a, a component mm -hmm. that uh, potential redistribution that could potentially um, contribute to long-term equitable distribution of land mm -hmm. um, while of course having a different uh, you know effect on indiv individual land tenure the ten mm -hmm. tenure of individual families yeah. um, mm -hmm. over specific pieces of land mm -hmm. you know, over shorter time periods yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, the uh, land uh, holding distribution in customary regimes tends to be equi fairly equitable because, you know, l once again, land is made available to families who are bona fide members of the community. And so, you know, it varies among communities. Some, some traditional authorities will claim kind of a stewardship or trusteeship role, uh, really a land administrative role. And in, 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 in many settings, really because of factors that came out of the colonial era, uh, asserting ownership of that land. Okay. South Africa is in a very difficult place in the post-apartheid era because uh, 
the political leadership had basically sort of deferred to the chiefs on, on how their understanding of their role in the tenure regime and their understanding is that I own it. <laughs> and so that's really raised lots of issues. There's some interesting issues in Ghana around the, the constitutional role of chiefs in land stewardship and trusteeship where they're converting that into, in their minds or their views, uh, ownership. So there you know, some issues there, uh, real concerns. Uh, but as a system, it's really about uh, assuring kind of a, uh, a basic level of livelihood and income and a home for uh, families. Now, customary tenure systems are also adaptive to new kinds of changes in, in the economy. So research I did in Lesotho some years ago, this is an economy, high levels of out-migration of mainly men working in the mines in South Africa, sort of labor shortages in the agricultural sector, sort of men kind of disappearing, and, and, then, and then women, uh, widows, having control over the land. And so the customary tenure system can resolve the kind of problem of, well, the sons are off of the mines, and the wife is sort of kind of in this kind of in-between space about her authority over the land. Well, the customary tenure authority said women inherit from their husbands. The sons do not. The sons inherit from the wife. So that's an adaptation. And then the system started adapting to this notion of, well, women, widows often without, uh, you know, male labor had a strong land right, now clarified in customary law, but didn't have access to draft power, you know, oxen, cash for inputs. And so the system started sanctioning a, a sort of a sharing in, so a, a sharecropping kind of regime, where the, the landholder would basically go into a sharecropping arrangement or rent out their land to uh, a farmer who lacked land, not a wealthy guy, typically a guy, but who had draft power, could bring soil fertility up to that. So that's sort of an adaptation that's very significant, enabling, in this case, a, a, a widow to mobilize an asset in ways that generates income. So there's adaptivity. Now, I just want to also add, there's tremendous popular support for customary tenure uh, in Africa. And we see some efforts to you know, convert it for other uses uh, or into other regimes. Uh, and that those are generally resisted, so this is an area you have to go very carefully. Just one comment on, on China. Accompanying their individualization processes would have been other agrarian re reform factors. So the response in post-reform, you know, pre-reform, it was just not land. It was a whole host of things, prices, and a whole host of things that would, uh, would uh, uh, de-incentivate uh, investment uh, as well as land. Well, as a Sephorian, yes, <laughs> I would like to hear more about how this, what you're finding in your reviews about the, how the tenure regimes, so tenure policies, how they are related to un, the anti-forest hypothesis. Um, Tom Rodell published a, an article, a couple of articles mm -hmm. about how the Schwarz, when they got tenure, have produced one of the massive deforestation uh -huh. in Ecuador. Uh -huh. yeah. In the name of increasing food productivity, mm -hmm. when they produced the sugar cane, yeah. they didn't have market to sell. Mm -hmm. But the damage was already done. Mm -hmm. And I could go over in other questions, in other, in other examples, but I would like to know more about that. Mm -hmm. how tenure is a tool for replacing land use activities that are based on forests on trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well that's a huge, very important question. And it gets into the sort of issues of kind of agency and the state's role in protecting the forest domain against, you know, what, what rural people will do with it if given, if given uh, given the, the kind of the right to the, to the land. And, you know, a way of thinking about this is that, uh, you know, any tenure regime is not based on the whole bundle of rights, if you will, placed in a particular individual or family or community. Those rights are shared among a host of interests. And, you know, we think of the bundle, sticks in the bundle. And so with respect to the, the forest rights devolution efforts, you know, William has written about and others have written about, 
you know, we're, we're not really looking at programs that, that give communities necessarily all use and management rights. The idea is to devolve a significant amount of use and management rights to communities to enable them to make their own judgments about how best to lose, use those resources, forests and other resources. Now, typically, states retain some rights, regulatory rights, that condition the exercise of the use and management rights of the communities. Now, now if it's a, a forest area that the community wants to move, remove all the trees, well, that's going to have to be negotiated because there is a public interest arguably, and this is going to be negotiated within the politics and policies of any given country, there is a public interest in forest conservation. It has, you know, forest degradation has external effects on watersheds, on health and the planet. So I don't know, not knowing the circumstances, and I'd love to see that particular study. It sounds like an important study. One wants to look at it. But on the other side, you've got the question of state ownership all the use, the greater part of use and management rights being concentrated in the state, and what those imply for the ability of rural people to realize their livelihood goals, exercise their agency over land use, and uh, and stewardship uh, over resources, and and what's lost in terms of diminishment of rights, dignity, livelihoods, and environmental outcomes, in many cases, when those rights are denied. So I think getting into the case-by-case uh, -case basis here is very, very important. It's, I think it's very much a balance and distribution of those rights. My caution is that we see a, for, a formal devolution of, of use and management rights as part of the rights devolution movement to communities, but the states are retaining significant control over how those rights are exercised through permitting uh, controls and uh, requirements for management plans, which are very onerous and very restrictive. So this is, a, I think, a very important area of research uh, because there's huge emphasis on rights to evolution for, on the, on the premise that there'll be better, there'll be jointly positive social and environmental outcomes. And let's, let's, you know, let's get to work in testing those hypotheses. Questions? Uh, please, oh, Daniel. Daniel. Okay. Thank you. Very enlightening. Um, we did similar kind of study on different topics, but mm -hmm. uh, at the end of your, just you, you just said about the development of hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of common approach after doing such a huge kind of literature survey? You hypothesize thing to to develop future kind of research. Yeah. Okay. Well, this whole question, yeah, there is. And um, uh, Arun Agarwal at Michigan and a few others in the in a, in a, it was in a study I did with these some of these colleagues involved a few years ago. We were seeing some research that were uh, that were not not quite systematic reviews, but we're looking at trying to control do our, our RCTs if you will of. Uh, of areas of forest, including in Latin America, that were under community management and controlling for a host of things, access to roads and climate and so on and so forth, presence of police, and areas that were under state ownership and management for uh, livelihood and environmental outcomes, and with environmental outcomes, for instance, measured by changes in canopy over time. Uh, in areas under s community stewardship versus the state. And the evidence, once again, I, I, I have to go back and look at this sort of methodologies, was suggesting in a number of cases jointly positive outcomes. Okay. So, so I think that's very important research. I mean, what it, it comes back to, uh, you know, so many questions arising around things like zero deforestation, which colleagues in governance are working on. And, what, what are the outcomes in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions? I mean, let's look at that question. I mean, we've got, we have different governance regimes, Daniel. We have state regulation, regula uh, state ownership of forest regulation. We've got red plus regimes based within governments, giving rein to PES regimes, but kind of high regulatory elements. We have certification 
experience and regimes, and we have zero deforestation. Now, what difference do this, these management regimes make with respect to things that we're concerned with? Greenhouse gas emission reductions, you know, for instance. Now, state stewardship of forests in Brazil and Indonesia arguably has, has been problematic in terms of land use conversion outcomes, as we're aware. So are there alternatives that we could look at? I mean, a very interesting report from Brazil the other day showed that companies uh, uh, in the soy sector are all observing the soil memorandum that prohibits deforestation. And, 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 that, and that there's only been 1% increase in land under this of deforestation of land under the stewardship of these companies. Okay, so, that's, so that seems to be like people are, this company are responding to the market pressures. The same study reported that only 30% of companies uh, in Brazil observe the forest code. <laughs> they basically ignore it. So the regulatory regime around that's seeking to regulate deforestation through law and regulation is there's kind of an indifference to it. So what's that about? You know, I mean, that's, you know, how are these governance regimes working? And I think we can look at those on a comparative basis. Okay, we so have one, one last question, Daisuke, and then we will. Uh, so I will be quick. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And <coughs> I was wondering when you always think about certification and they try to always secure tenure rights, but yeah. when then you comes into the problem of indigeneity, so of, of indigeneity. Yeah. So yeah. I was wondering in, uh, in your study how you deal, try to deal with this problem of indigeneity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 really, we really didn't, you know, the, the cases in Latin America were not, if you, if you mean by that indigenous communities, as, it, as the literature came up. And usually there's not a, the, you know, the indigenous forest rights movement and a activities and laws and reforms are very much about protecting collective rights. Okay, to the forest or to the landscape, and not about uh, converting to uh, you know uh, on the individual basis. It's really a collective basis. So we really didn't really didn't look at that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting question. Okay. Well, since that was, uh, is there another another question? Since that's a very that was a very short question, I will take. Oh, yeah. I will right. allow okay. myself to ask one more <laughs> question, and I'm going to try to be, try to be as provocative as possible without okay. being completely dumb. Um, um, and it's obviously about migration, and it's yeah. about yeah. Um, um, whether the fact is that um, urbanization and migration are real mm -hmm. facts, and um, the great sort of transfer of people more towards yep. and urban-based both both existence and income generation and all is a fact almost everywhere or at mm -hmm. least that's the trend um, are we being are we being sentimental mm -hmm. in talking about um, customary land rights as the most important thing we should be looking at um, you know is it is the real limitation the fact that people can't under any customary law can, probably can't sell their their rights effectively in order to then invest in urban areas. Are we just, have we just become so focused on this particular area, something that necessarily is good and, uh, and our donors like, mm -hmm. um, that we're really ignoring important new trends that, mm -hmm. that say that it's actually a sort of a divorcing from that land and investment in other activities that really is the, the, the key to reducing poverty mm -hmm. and uh, raising productivity in these mm -hmm. areas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think we're being sentimental. Um, and here's why. I, and I, well, it's, it's not about so much what I, what I think about, about the customary tenure, it's about, about the effects on you know, what customary tenure does. I think the evidence will support this, but here's an area of needed research in increasing the livelihood, improving the livelihood, uh, uh, food security, and other sort of prospects of rural people in transitioning economies. If you want to, by transitioning, we mean migration. And, you know, I really kind of grew up, if you will, in terms of my own work in southern Africa, which is a region no other region, well, I'm sure one can make the case that there are others that has been so, where the rural areas have been so affected by migration. And this, this great kind of magnet of South African industry 
drawing low-cost labor into the factories and the mines, and then because of the apartheid regime, uh, really not getting those folks uh, kind of rights. That's all changing now, of course, uh, very importantly. But people came from Botswana, neighboring countries, not just the rural areas of South Africa, but Zimbabwe, Malawi, uh, Botswana, Lesotho, half of all working age men in Lesotho in the mid-1980s were working in the mines, in the mines in South Africa. Okay. So what is this, you know, but then there was this persistent, what I would characterize as commitment on the part of my, of the migrant, of families that had sent some migrants to South Africa to customary tenure. And why? Because once again, it comes back to this notion that in the urban setting, people lacked rights. They lacked the money to, even through their jobs, low income jobs to, uh, uh, to buy housing. They lacked, you know, service land. You know, Nairobi has two million people in just one, in one slum. Uh, you know, a great sort of characteristic of African urban migration is informality in the urban sector. There is not housing. People retain interests, economic and social interests, in rural areas that provide some measure of social and economic security against the vagaries of the low wage, low income, low opportunity economy that poor people face. And so I would say, let's ask them. You know, I, I remember having a conversation in, in a hotel in Vintook a few years ago in Namibia with uh, the waitress. I like to chat with people about where they, sorry, it's anecdotal evidence, but uh, it's still evidence. And I asked her you know, to tell me her story. Well, of course, you know, she, her home was up north in the cattle producing area. Her son was with her mom. She was making cash in Vintook to send home to invest in buying livestock and in housing. And her prospects for doing any of that on a family basis in Vintook were very limited. And you know, she identified with home. For her, I mean, in Vintook and other cities in Southern Africa on the holidays, people are home, which means the cities are empty. Home is where you know, the customary land is. So let's, I'd say, this is a dynamic system, it's adaptive, it's responsive, but it's providing secure assets to people as a social right. As a, so let me just make one more comment if I could. The, the Convention's International Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights, which all but three, South, all but three African countries are signatories to, provides that countries aspire to a whole host of outcomes economically that are dependent upon a land right. And these are the right to shelter, arguably a land right, a secure land right, right to shelter, right to livelihood. Now, under our feet in Africa is a system that delivers land to families as a social right. And we're acting as if it's not there. How, how, you know, these countries are in a position now to deliver on that aspect of the covenant by protecting their customary tenure systems. If anyone's got anything better to offer, you know, in terms of upgrading informal settlements and giving title and coming up with, uh, uh, you know, credit and other regimes to sort of do that, well, those have been tried, but they've had very, very little effect. Time is to tell, but I think over the longer term, we want people to have the ability to make the judgments about what's in their family's best economic interests. And we do that by you know, allowing them to retain an, a right. It's a right that they currently enjoy as a social right. Well, thank you very much. And I'm so <laughs> glad we ended on this positively sort of, of, of lovely. <laughs>